fourth of four webinars. I can't believe it's already been it's already been four weeks. Welcome everybody to the fourth and for now the final the final um, webinar in the series uh, by presentation guru. My name is John Zimmer, and with me is Jim Harvey, and we are two of the three co-founders of Presentation Guru. Word about the website, it's presentation-guru.com. And the reason we call it Guru, it's not that we're gurus, it's that most of the articles on this news magazine for public speaking, there are dozens, hundreds of articles written by dozens of different people. And the, we think the, the strength of the site is that you're getting perspectives from a bunch of different people. As I said, this is the fourth webinar in a series of four. And when Jim and I were thinking about how we're going to put this together, there were three things that we thought would be useful. First, how to create a strong story. And we focused on that in the first and second webinars. Then how to create and use visuals that work. And that was the subject matter of last week's webinar. And today we're going to talk about how to say it as yourself with skill. So you've now prepared, you've got your story, you've done the visuals, now you're on stage and how to say it as yourself with skill. Mm -hmm. And as we were discussing what we could do for this, Jim and I, we each kept coming back to, we worked independently and when we, we met, we had both focused on one word and that word is charisma. Yeah, and I think the great thing about having a relatively small number of people on the on the webinar is that it can be a conversation as well. Um, obviously, I think what we want to do is we want to share an opinion because I think audiences like an opinion because they know where they can either agree with it or disagree with it or shape it for themselves. So we're going to give you an opinion. Like charisma is one of those misunderstood words, I think that the people that apparently have it, be they a rock star or a film star, want you to think that it's magical. Whereas actually my understanding of it, and John and my understanding of it, is it actually it's much simpler than that. That everybody has charisma. It's a positive and a negative thing. And actually what it is can be defined really simply. This dog has it. Our definition of charisma, and actually dogs have it and respond to it from humans, higher levels of primates have it and a few other creatures, but it's the ability to transfer their emotions to a third party or multiple third parties, to make somebody else feel something by their words, their deeds, their actions and their energy. And the great thing for me, something John and I were talking about, is you can bullshit a lot of people, but you can't bullshit dogs and you can't bullshit children because they read energy. Ignore the words, ignore the music and read energy. You can't pretend to a dog that you like dogs when you don't. And that transfers an emotion to the third party. So we think that everybody that has charisma, positive and negative, essentially all they're doing is transferring an emotion that they have consciously or unconsciously to other people. So we thought of a few examples from the real world. The Dalai Lama, okay? Me, and this is a personal opinion, whenever I see him, hear him, think of him, I get a sense of peace from him to me. Everything about him communicates something like that. A, a hero of mine, Robin Williams. Great guy. You know? I mean, it's never as simple as one emotion. Now, with Robin Williams' passing, but I think of many things of sadness and loss, but seeing him perform as I have live, watching him, understanding him, gives me a sense of the possibility and the joy that people can give to one another through their words and their actions. A truly charismatic man that made me feel joy and wonder and laughter and curiosity, all of those things. And then possibly the most commercially successful woman in the world who has built a global empire largely from her ability to make other people feel good about her. And I see Oprah and it's easy to ignore the essential quality about us that people like her because she makes them like themselves. Mm. Warmth is what I get when I think about Oprah Winfrey. And I think everybody has charisma because all of us in our lives 
sometimes, mostly unconsciously, but sometimes consciously have made people, have changed people's state in an instant from being sad to happy by giving them a cuddle or a kiss or saying something beautiful to them. In my case with my parents, by making them, transferring them from being happy to being terribly unhappy with a sarcastic comment or a cruel thing or what everybody is charismatic. Mm. What's really interesting, uh, Jim, about the three uh, images that we have, you know, from the Dalai Lama to Robin Williams to Oprah, if people step back and think about the three personalities, they're all very different, these personalities. They're all, you know, from high energy to very calm, very zen to very inquisitive. And I think that's the key thing that I pull out of this is that everyone is charismatic in his or her own way. Yeah. And more often than not, <clears throat> the most charismatic people that we know are friends that make us die laughing at their stories or our colleagues that show us every day that they care mm. for customers or clients or whatever. But the reason why, and for everybody that's just joined, um, we started late. We've, we've had a bit of a problem with ticketing. So if you've been delayed, sorry about that, but welcome. Um, we're starting off this webinar just talking about this idea of charisma because we think that charisma is the thing, the quality, the ability to change the way an audience feels by transferring your emotions to them is the foundation of speaking as yourself with skill. So moving on. And really this whole idea of changing the way somebody feels is based upon a really well-documented psychological process that's called emotional contagion now contagion at this moment in time is a word that has other connotations we are neither being um you trying should. to be funny or insensitive but you we all have the ability to infect our surroundings and the people around us with our emotions and it's really well documented as a condition the ability that your emotions have to trigger similar emotions and behaviors in other people it's really well documented and essentially charisma is merely the visible practical extension of this underlying con um, quality that human beings have and so emotional contagion and charisma the ability to transfer an emotion deliberately to an audience is of course part of making a message unforgettable you need to have a message you need to have uh, visuals and a story and all that kind of stuff but if you've got all of those things and then fail to deliver it to an audience with some kind of emotional connection an emotional contagion if you get it and this is the dictionary definition emotional contagion when you get it when you earn it you have a synchrony, a degree of mutual control between individuals. And that really, all of the tools and thoughts that we're going to share today really answer the question, how can all of us be more consciously and more deliberately charismatic when we need it? And when we need it is when we want an audience to listen, understand, and maybe do some of the things that we're, we're talking about. And, and I think... Examples too. Yeah, exactly. We've got some examples. A um, couple of examples here. So I, I, it works through the medium of television. I want to show you um, a couple of short video clips about how quickly it works. I'm going to show you about a 35 second video clip. This is an interview, 2012. The Olympics were in the United Kingdom. And from being a country that essentially didn't expect to win anything, because we never do, because we're not very good in many things. Um, suddenly, the whole nation and our athletes were transformed into world beaters. And the worst thing is that some of our athletes expected to win and then didn't. So these are two rowers. <laughs> I'm not laughing at them. These are two rowers who failed to win a gold medal when they really should, partly because their, bo their boat broke. Now, the setup is this, they're being interviewed by a sports reporter after the event and just listen if you can for the effect that their emotion has on this hard bitten sports reporter. It's a beautiful example of emotional contagion. Mark, yeah, we have to talk because we have to talk and there's probably nothing, nothing in the world you want to do less than talk about that race. But 
What are your thoughts now? We gave everything. We tried everything. We were going to win so badly. Just sorry to everybody who let down. You let nobody down. After the year that you guys have had, you let nobody down at all. So if you don't want to talk about it now, we'll leave it. And you probably heard it, but the, the interview there was a sports journalist called John Inverdale, who is about as subtle and as caring as, um, well, somebody that isn't very subtle and caring. He asked the question, they said, we let everybody down. And even this hard-bitten old journalist was moved to say, you've let nobody down. And, and, at the end, and to add, at the end, we, we, we will send out the links to all of all, in, in the, to the, to the videos. And at the end, uh, he turns to the camera. They've walked away because they still won silver. They still actually did very well. And he walks away, and this reporter, Inverdale, he is choked up trying to get ready for the next race coming. So, yeah. And it's really interesting, even though I was laughing, it, I, in watching it five or six times and putting these things together, it is moving because somebody is sharing their emotions naturally and without filters and it changes the way that you feel the next one is just funny and, and embarrassing. You laugh at. <laughs> sorry this yeah you can't laugh at it and i'm sorry that these are both uk based but i just used examples that meant something to me that maybe you haven't seen before but anyway so we have two politicians here we have one world famous for his charisma his ability to charge a room with hope and joy and passion namely barack obama and then we have a british politician called gordon brown who if you wanted to kill the mood at a wedding you'd invite gordon brown to stand up and speak now it's a really simple thing gordon brown is taking barack obama for tea and talks at his house, Downing Street in central London. All Gordon Brown has to do is walk across the street and walk into his own front door. Watch what happens. And if you are failed, if you fail to be moved by what happens, then I suggest you go and uh, speak to a psychiatrist because there's something wrong with you. Let me play the video. All he had to do was walk across his own street and in through his front door. Barack Obama, present in the moment, sees a man in uniform, respectfully shakes him by the hand and makes the man's days courteous and charming. Gordon Brown, not really knowing what to do, having probably walked through that door a hundred times straight past the policeman, leaves the policeman hanging with his hand out. Is, was anybody in the audience not mortified by that? Yeah. It's cringe. It's cringeworthy. I cringe every time I see it. It's and it doesn't mean you hate Gordon Brown. It just means human. All of us, even ten years ago, are susceptible to the emotions, positive and negative, created by the words, the actions, the energy, the behaviour of the speaker on stage. Mm -hmm. And we just want we we know that you know that, but I just thought we wanted to start this webinar on performance how can you make all of your hard work in creating a story and creating visuals land with an audience and part of it is the emotional wavelength and connection that you make with with your crowd yeah. um, charisma for speakers we think is essentially those things that we're going to talk about now john yeah i mean and when we talk about charisma for speakers we want to talk about things that give practical ideas about things you can do before, during, and after the presentation. But before we get into those, very famous quote from former uh, uh, poet, uh, the poet uh, laureate for the United States, Maya Angelou. And she said, people will forget what you said. They might even forget what you did. Who can complete the quote? Just in the chat. What, finish the quote. Or 
if you want to say, if it's quicker, just say it, Agnes, if you want to just unmute. I saw you raise your hand. I can only see a few. Uh, but it's about how you uh, made them feel. Yes, a bunch of people are putting it in, and that's right. They, they will never forget how you made them feel. And this is really what charisma is. It's all about getting your audience to feel something. And when you're on stage, you know, depending on what you're talking about, depending on the situation, depending on who the audience is, you might want them to feel a variety of different things. And on the screen here, we have a dozen. These are not the only things you may want them to feel. They, you know, the, the list is almost endless, as, as, as many emotions as there are. But it's also it's making people feel how you feel. And so if you want them to feel inspired when you get on stage, you have to feel inspired about what it is you're talking about. If you want them to feel confident, you've got to get yourself feeling confident as well. But it's all about this idea of transferring an emotion, a feeling from you to your audience. In previous, in previous webinars, we talked about Aristotle and his three pillars. And one of the pillars of, of rhetoric is pathos, which is the emotion. And these are the, this idea of connecting with your audience on an emotional level. And it's very, very important. I love to think of empathy as an emotional boomerang. Because if you send it out, it will come back from the audience. And this is what we want to get into now. We want to talk about some concrete tips on how you can have this empathy with your audience, on how you can actually really be there for the audience, really feel for the audience. And as I said earlier, we're going to talk about before, during, and after. So before you speak, the first thing you want to do is actually something you don't want to do is don't be like Larry. Should they, Jim? No, they shouldn't. Very short story. Larry, I won't mention his surname, was a multimillionaire marketing guru that when I was 25 and doing my first work with big clients around the world was given to me to work with and support as part of a massive global marketing strategy deployment by Electrolux, the Swedish white goods company. Larry was breathtakingly good as a speaker. And we worked for three months together all towards this um, event in Vienna where 350 people from Central and Eastern Europe, just two years after the wall had come down, were coming together to listen to the great man and be inspired to go out and sell lots of washing machines and cookers and fridges and freezers. Everything was going perfectly. 350 people in the room, young, well-educated people from the former Soviet bloc, listening to this guru. And uh, Larry was, had them in the palm of his hand, was rising to the central theme of his speech, which he had created for himself, wanted no help and was very protective of. And he said, so, and I will do an impersonation, apologies to all the Americans. So, ladies and gentlemen, what we need to make sure that is for 1992, that Electrolux is the first choice in every kitchen in Poland. And he was expecting a standing ovation. And there was just a confused silence. So he tried again. And not just Poland. Latvia, Lithuania, he was showing off that he knew 35 different countries. Latvia, Lithuania, Georgia, Russia. Again, just the, the harder he tried, the less he got back. And a, a young woman in the front row put her hand up and said very politely, Mr. Light, <clears throat> have you ever been in a Polish kitchen? And he went, why? And she said, well, it's important that if this is the the key message that you understand what a Polish kitchen looks like. A kitchen's a kitchen, isn't it? And then other people started putting that. It was a bit like the scene in Spartacus. Other people started putting their hands up saying, have you been in a Russian kitchen? Have you been in a Romanian kitchen? And he, Larry was just saying, no, I haven't. I haven't. And it went straight back to the lady at the front. And she said, Mr. very politely, Mr. Light, my father is a surgeon, my mother is a surgeon, my sister is a nurse, my brother is a lawyer, 
my husband is a, a lawyer. We live in a six room apartment in the center of Warsaw. In our kitchen, we have a cooker and a table. There is no room for a fridge or a refrigerator or whatever. And he said, yeah, but you missed my point. I'm just saying, and by which time he'd lost, basically Larry had ignored virtually all of the things that John was, is gonna talk about now. And in terms of empathy had driven any, he walked in and he had the audience's full support. Five minutes later, he had nothing because he just he insulted their intelligence. And the whole theme of the speech was built around the line that didn't work. So when it comes to things you can do before, we, we hit on three things. Have a message, walk the room, warm up. Message. When it comes to having a message, you've got to really be clear in your mind what is the one thing, the absolute one thing, the red thread, or as the French call it, le fil rouge, that connects your presentation from beginning to end. It's got to be a clear message for your audience. But the flip side of having this message, and this is the side that a lot of people leave out, is what is the relevance of your message for the audience? I always tell my, my, the people that I work with, the, the clients, I say, you've got to ask yourself, why should the audience care about what you're going to say? And you've got to come up with at least one reason. Because if you can't, then you're either giving uh, the wrong message to the audience or you're speaking to the wrong audience. Do you have anything you want to add on message? I'm, why should they care? Why should they believe you? And how do you know that it that it's right for them. One of the best books I read about messaging is David Ogilvie on advertising. He said, copywriters, we create 50 messages. The best message is the one that tests best with the audience. And I think from that point of view, the, the, the final arbiter for Larry's message had not been tested at all. And if he'd done it once, he'd have realized it didn't work. The other thing that, that we're big believers in is walking the room, getting there early. I, my approach, whenever I have a speaking engagement, my approach is like my approach today when I have to fly somewhere. Of course, nobody's flying anywhere, but when things are normal, when I fly, I want to be at the airport through security with plenty of time. When I was younger, I would always calculate backwards. My flight leaves at 10, it would take me 25 minutes from security, and I'd work back and I would leave home at the latest possible moment. I don't know how many flights I ended up just running for, breathing hard, sweaty, and I thought, I'm never doing that again. So I wanna be there early. So when I have a speaking engagement, I always arrive early, do all the tech checking, I walk the room, I stand at the back of the room to get a sense of what it's like for the people back there. I meet the tech person who is always your best friend, they're the ones who can really help you out in the moment if anything goes wrong. But another advantage of walking the room, getting there early, is that you can meet the first few people who are coming in. And that's something you should do, definitely should do it. Because one, you start to build rapport with your audience even before you step on the stage. Secondly, somebody might say something to you that you find that, oh, it's actually linked to your speech. And if you're thinking and you're present, you can work that into your presentation or speech when you're on stage. And you can say, well, as I was discussing with Sarah earlier today, such and such. And I tell you, audiences love that. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I spoke at a big event for uh, Procter & Gamble here in, um, in, in Switzerland. And it was a full day event. And my session was just an hour. It was from 11 to 12. And I wasn't going to use slides. And so when I told this to the organizers, they said, well, that's great. If, um, if you don't need slides, you just show up around 1045 because we'll be in a coffee break and then you can go on. And I asked them, I said, would you mind if I showed up early? And they said, no, not at all. You're more than welcome. So I was there at 830 in the morning, having breakfast with people, talking to them and listening as well to the other, to the other, um, to the other uh, speakers because, and taking notes. And when I did my presentation, I actually referred to about three or four of them as we heard from so-and-so, as so-and-so said throughout the presentation. And at lunch, I stayed for lunch, the, the one comment that kept coming back and back was, that was amazing how you would link your talk to what other people said because it showed that I cared about them. 
The final advantage for walking the room and meeting people, at least a few people in your audience, is that you learn something, you discover something, and it's always the same thing. They're just people. They're just people like you and me with the same hopes and dreams and fears and insecurities. And what too often happens, you have a speaking engagement at a big conference or for a big company and you're saying, oh, I've got to speak at such and such a conference or for such and such a company. But at the end of the day, you're just speaking to people. And when you go early and start talking to them, you realize they're just people, just like you and me. So go early, walk the room. One of the things, John, on that point that you see quite a lot, and I think this is a, I think lots of these things are basic social courtesy that for whatever reason we put on hold sometimes when we're speaking. Um, you see expert speakers in the room as the faithful walk in to, to listen to their words of wisdom with their backs to the audience, talking to the senior people on the stage and laughing and joking. And then only when the congregation have taken their seats does the person, which I don't think is very polite. Mm. It's polite and impractical. And sometimes the, the simple courtesies, like John said, if you're the speaker and they find you among them, one person or 10 people might have shaken your hand and said, good morning. But 100 people out of 300 will have seen that and will have thought, oh, this person's different interesting and so there's that sort of it's show and tell by starting with the audience you show them that you're actually interested in their experience and who they are and what they've done and all of those kind of things but at its heart i think often the biggest the best question to ask is not how you feel but what is the most socially courteous thing that you can do with the 350 people that have come to sit down and listen to you speak and it's often not stand on the stage and talk to the top Top woman. John. Indeed. Ramin, Ramin just had a comment. He, said uh, he says uh, about the point about they're just people. He says it always surprises him as well, especially when nervous or stressed or speaking to an audience of high level authorities. And Bill, I missed the comment, Bill, from the earlier point about the message. I love this. After you write your speech, think as an audience member, so what? I love the bluntness. Absolutely right. The third thing to do before warm up. What I will do, especially if you're speaking on a big stage to a lot of people, you've got to be yourself, but you've got to be a bigger version of yourself. So what I will do before a speech, I will find someplace private. You don't do this on stage because people will think you've lost your mind. But literally, I'm sitting down now, but I will bounce lightly up and down. I will swing my arms around. I will do some vocal exercises, like the, sound, the Z sound, a buzz, a zzz, a buzz of a B to warm up my throat. I will, um, and I know Mel does this as well, I, I chew gum, either a spearmint type gum or a lemony gum to get the, 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 saliv uh, the salivary glands going so that your throat isn't dry. Stretching, tongue twisters, you can and you should warm up because it will give you this energy when you go on stage. It's, it's very much like what athletes do. If you, giving a speech is very much like playing a sport. I've played lots of sports over the years. Some of you have played sports, I'm sure. I love to watch sports and think of a sport you've watched, whether it's tennis or football or hockey or whatever. Are the, are the players waiting, you know, looking at their watches, waiting for the referee to come on stage? No, they're on the field. They're stretching for 40 minutes, running, kicking the ball. They're skating, shooting the puck. They're warming up. And so warming up is going to help give you that burst of energy when you get on stage. George is also saying, uh, Julian, uh, Julian treasures TED Talk for this. Okay, yes, I've seen it. And Christina also helps to calm the nerves a little, talking to the audience. But this is the previous comment. Absolutely. So these are some ideas of things that you can, and we say should do, before you take the stage. Now, when it comes to being on the stage, three things. Throw the rock, adjust the dial, and connect. So what do we mean by these? Throw the rock. Well, first thing, you know, I grew up on in Canada on the shores of Lake Erie, one of, one of the five great lakes. And our house wasn't on the lake, but it wasn't very far. And so as a kid, I would love to 
go down to the lake. And the best time of day was in the morning because often there was nobody around. And the best mornings were the days when the air was clear. Uh, you, know, you could see across the lake, the water was like glass. And on the other side, I could see the United States. I could see parts of New York State and then a little farther down, Pennsylvania. And for me, that other side of the lake was the most exotic place in the world because it was a different country. I could see it. I couldn't get to it, but I could see it. And what I would do is I would pick up rocks and I would throw a rock as far as I could and I would land with this plop in the lake. And then I would just watch the ripples spreading out, 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 out. And I was amazed at how far they would go. And I would sit there imagining that one of those ripples actually made it over to the other shore. It reached the United States. Now, metaphorically, this is exactly what you do every time you stand on stage. Your message is like the rock and the audience is like the lake. And you are throwing your message into the rock and what, into the lake. And what you hope happens is that the message resonates with people. What you want to happen is that your words touch the people in the audience and may they go out and they do something that affects other people, which in turn can affect other people, so on and so on. And of course, you will never know how far the ripples extend, but knowing is far less important than throwing the rock in the first place. So when we say throw the rock, it's about delivering your message with all of the energy and the passion and the determination that you can muster because that's your biggest chance to have an impact. It's a really nice point, John. And I think it goes to most of us who have, I mean, I basically have been a salesman for 25 years, something like that. Um, selling, you know, my own company's products and services and, and helping other people do that as well. There's no worse feeling for a salesperson that when you've gone in, you spent weeks working on a big pitch, you go in and you come out feeling like you didn't actually say what you meant to say for whatever reason, whether you tried to be something that you weren't bigger, you know, more experienced, whether you backed off from what you thought was a strong and honest message and gave half a message. There's nothing worse than that. And I think that's the thing we're talking about. You know, as a, as a human being, if you start to, I mean, essentially the, the next point, that every time you, you go in front of an audience, if you think about it, you, you've got a dial, you know, and the dial is too gentle. You know? Did you really say what you meant to say in the way that you meant to say it with the feeling that you'd put into it and the belief that you had? And sometimes our dial is just too low for the audience. And sometimes, for other reasons, the dial's set too high. Either because we don't understand the audience well enough or we've missed one of their most important points or on the day we didn't really connect into how they were feeling and start where they were. Your dial's too big, so you're too big. You're too confident, you're too brash, you're too bold, you're too loud, you're all of these things. I think as, as in the early stages of, of our speaking careers, isn't it often the case that we just want to get through the speech? We want to get to the end of our presentation and hope that it went okay. But as we get that experience beneath us, we've played hundreds of games. We've done, you know, like, like Mel's done, you know, 300 stand-up gigs. Then you want to get flexible. Then you want to be able to adjust the message, the tone, your connection, the order of the presentation, sometimes whatever, to adjust that to absolutely meet the people and the circumstances and the room that you have in front of you, even if it's not the room that you planned for. To be more, you know, going back to the stand up comedy thing, to be able to walk into a room of people that are 30 years younger than you were imagining them to be and half as responsive and still walk away feeling like you've done something that made them feel good rather than just being so inflexible that you just think 
sod it, they're going to have what I prepared. And those are the moments where you walk out thinking, oh, no, what's gone wrong? And I think most of us can. So this idea of adjust your dial is learn how to start where the audience is, build a connection with them in some of the ways that John's talked about, even if it's walking straight into a meeting room. So if you're walking in to do a pitch, it's a really weird thing to walk into a panel, stand there, open up your laptop, plug it in and start speaking. There's probably five minutes of, hello, how are you? My name's this, nice to see you again, haven't met before, it's really nice. How's it been so far? Just social courtesies that allow you to test how they are and where they are and how they think and how they feel and ask them questions and listen that allows you then to recalibrate. Mm. And so that was what we meant by adjusting your dial. The fundamental principle of emotional intelligence is understand your own emotions, understand the emotions of other people and be able to adjust yours to theirs to become more influential. Mm. And that's what we mean. John? And I just picking up on a point, Bill had this in, in with regard to, uh, with regard to uh, storytelling. I love this. One of the great pieces of advice, it's not how you tell the story, it's how other people tell your story after you've told them. That's brilliant, Bill. Is that, is, that's in quotes. Is that your quote? Because if it is, I'm stealing it and attributing it to you. It's already done, John. It's got your name on it. It's now a piece of social media collateral. Excellent, excellent. Bill who? No. Yeah, that's right. Bill uh, doesn't appear anyway. John, over to you. Right. So the third thing is about connection. And here we just want to touch on two very basic ways of connecting. The first is eye contact. Yeah. Look at your audience. If you are reading notes, yeah. it breaks the contact. If you are turning and you are reading off the slides that you've got up on there because there's so much text on your slides because you didn't see our third webinar, it breaks the contact. Look at the audience. Now, obviously, if you can speak without notes, that's the best of all. But if you have notes, keep them simple. Type them up. Have them big font so you can actually don't have to lift them up. You can put them on a table. Just take a glance. Check where you are and get back to the audience. If you are speaking in a small room, you can make eye contact over the course of your presentation with everyone. If you're speaking to a large audience, you can't necessarily do that. So a good tip, good piece of advice. Imagine a tic-tac-toe board, you know, X's and O's. It's a grid, three by three. What I will do is I will mentally divide my audience into a three by three grid. Left is from my point of view. Left, center, right, front, middle, back. And then I remind myself, look at people in the different sectors. So left, back, center, middle, center, front, right, middle right front, etc. And this way you cover the room and when you look at people in a certain quadrant, people around them are going to feel that you are looking at them as well because you're so distant. There's a real, just a thought on that as well, John, came from an actor that, um, that I spoke to once who's been working at Shakespeare's Globe Theatre in London, which is um, an open air theater, essentially it's open to the sky. So for actors, it's very rare that you can actually see every single member of your audience because usually they're in the dark and there's floodlights, footlights, and they can't see. She was saying, she was playing a particular part and she said it was really important that she had to seduce the audience. She had to make all of the women hate her and all of the men be slightly enamored of her. So she said she would pick, in every part of the audience, she would pick the most handsome man she could find and say every word to that man looking into his eyes. And she said, and if you look into the eyes of a single person 50 metres away, everybody, men and women included, think that you're saying it's to them because they... So yes, zone, absolutely, but for you, for truth, say it, pick a single pair of eyes top row 400 meters away and and everything about your delivery changes it feels like you're speaking to a human being absolutely uh one last point about eye contact 
And this is, again, if you are traveling, if you are speaking to an audience that is relatively culturally homogenous, but of a different culture, spend a little time learning about proper business etiquette. Based in Geneva, I do a lot of work with uh, the United Nations and different international organizations. And it's always a fascinating experience. And I'll always remember, I had this three-day training with eight people. And it was a perfect microcosm, I guess you can't say a microcosm of the world, but it was perfect slice of the world. There was a woman from Japan, a woman from South Korea, a man from India, a man from Egypt, a woman from Sweden, a woman from France, a man from the UK, and a man from the US. So you had from east to west. And when we were talking about eye contact, it was fascinating because Whereas in North America, Canada, the US, people want the eye contact. They want the speaker to look at them and they crave that con eye contact. For people in the Far East, in Japan, South Korea, if I'm looking at you and speaking like this with this level of intensity, already that's starting to get too long. And so you, and as you, depending on whether you're moving east or west, the gradients change. So you want to be aware of that and connect by movement on the stage. And again, I'm not talking about choreography or you know, flourishes with your gestures. I'm simply talking about moving on the stage to the audience. The bigger the stage, the more you have to move because people to the sides are gonna feel left out if you're always on one side, if you're always in the center. But here's the thing, even in a small meeting room, you're speaking to 15, 20 people, even taking one or two steps in a direction, it changes the vibe for that part of the room. You're closer to the room. You're getting much closer to the room. So don't forget to move. And one way, I know some speakers, they will choreograph their speech, not by saying, oh, I'm gonna do this movement or that movement, but choreograph in the sense of, I've got three points to make. I'm going to start my speech in the middle here. I'm going to make my first point over on this side of the room. I'm going to come over and make the second one there, and I'll finish back in place. That's another way of uh, dealing with movement. So these are some quick ideas for what to do on the stage. But then, of course, there's also what to do after the event. Two very simple points, really. The first one that I'll cover, which is stick around. A friend of mine, mentor of mine, fabulous public speaker in the sort of in the slightly storytelling guru tradition um didn't like to prepare too much wanted a vague idea of of what he was supposed to say but would want to go and talk to the audience beforehand and get a sense of what would be valuable to them and often he did it really well his name was harvey peters he's a, a brilliant man harvey tells a lovely story he w loves to stay around at the end of speeches because he loves people and he wants people he wants to sell books he wants to sell products he wants to sell services so there's a commercial drive to it but he just loves getting feedback about how what he could do better and he'd done one thing for a firm of lawyers and uh, 500 people had given him a standing ovation for his inspiring speech and it, it was straight to coffee and he said, oh, I'm going to have coffee. If you want to come and talk to me, come and... and there were sort of 10 or 15 people trying to get to him. And at the front of the queue was a young woman who was, was, was thrilled to have met him and to listen to him and just wanted to tell him the effect that his speech had had on her. And um, they were standing in front of the coffee urns and he was really enjoying getting this positive feedback from a very talented and you know, interesting woman. And he was loving it so much that about five minutes into this conversation, she looked down at his crotch and said, Harvey, Harvey, you've wet yourself. Right? He hadn't, but he realized that she'd been so full on, she'd backed him into the coffee urn that had one of those little levers that he backed onto and the coffee, hot coffee, had gone scalding down the back of his trousers. And in the instant she said, you've wet yourself, he realized that his backside and his bits were scalding hot. And so he went from being the adored, <laughs> the adored public speaker getting praise from his audience to a man that was trying to rip his trousers off in public. And he said, it's one of those things, 
Yes, it's great to stick around. Yes, it's great to talk and connect with people, but you shouldn't really ever begin to believe your own publicity. Our first point is stick around and help them get more of you, get more benefit from you later. John. Yeah, stick around, talk to them. It's always nice. It's obviously, sometimes depending on our schedule, you can't. But the ideal is that if you have a speaking event schedule, build in time to stay around after to chat. I mean, it's good for you following up on business leads or whatever, but more importantly, it's a sign of respect. You can stay around, especially to answer any questions that people might not have had time to ask during. I would, I would say that, John. I think this is particularly important for very experienced speakers. It just looks rude. It looks to an audience like you've pocketed your, your, your $8,000 for your one and a half hour, you've given as much of them to you as you're gonna give, and then as soon as it's over, you're in a taxi and you're off. I just think it looks bad. It does, it does. The other thing we recommend is you know, stay in touch, follow up with, with people. Uh, what I will do is oftentimes I get asked, if, if, I, if I use slides, I will send uh, the client a PDF of the slides. If they ask, you know, I will also follow up with some additional information where they can learn more about whatever it was I was talking about. Stay in touch uh, with them following up after. These are little things that again, if we come back to this initial underlying theme of charisma and empathy with your audience, the fact that you're still giving uh, to them after the event, it shows that actually you, you care about the people. It's true. And I think one thing, for, I mean, obviously we've got lots of experienced speakers here. For the less experienced among you who might think it's a bit too salesy, I think in my experience, you know, sending them an email every week is, is too much. But once every three months, and even if they don't answer, it doesn't mean they don't care. It just means they're as busy as you are. But the moment that you send them something that piques their interest or they need or they're looking around, you will be the first person that they remember. I'm sure for lots of us, there's very few um, experiences as quite as nice as an email popping into your inbox or an, a LinkedIn connection or a text from somebody who starts by saying, oh, hi, Jim, haven't seen you for 10 years, but I thought about you the other day. And usually they've read something on LinkedIn or they've read an email or a newsletter or something. If you stop because you think they don't want it, that will never happen. If you do too much, you don't deserve it, but just staying in touch. I think that's an act of social courtesy. It's funny, Jim, when I have my email inbox in the morning and I see it's a message from you, I have to think, oh God, what does he want now? So it's funny, it's not the same with all people. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, thank you, John. I walked onto that, but I'll just, just move on because everybody that's watching this knows that you'd be so pleased. Anyway, let's go. You, and, and you keep telling yourself that story. No, you're absolutely right. I, and it's funny you say that because it, it was just a few weeks ago, I actually got an email similar on, it was similar to that from somebody I hadn't heard from in a long time. And it was really, a, it, was a pleasant, uh, it was a pleasant thing. Yeah. So Jim, three things that people can do. What, whoops. Meanwhile, Mike says, walk the room again after you're done. It sort of closes the meeting on a high note. I like that, Mike. That's, yeah. that's a good place. And I always think on those particular occasions where you're unhappy with the feet, just walking around with a hat in your hand is probably quite a good thing to do. As well. <laughs> Asking for contributions for your flight home. or your Subway flight. change, yes. I think the question for all of us is the next time we speak, whether it's in our company, whether it's in a, we're paid to do it, we're at Toastmasters, before you do it, listen to the people. Listen to what they're saying, listen to what they're not saying, listen to their energy, feel it and see what, and allow yourself to be led by that listening, then we're starting to become a more flexible speaker. And I think for all of us with experience, the real goal is to become much, because we all have our favorite crowds and our favorite speeches. So listen to the people and let them lead you. And by, lead, by being led by them, you will be given the authority to lead them. Play with your energy. I think one of the things about dial, but I've worked with a lot of actors and the things that they say is that, that there's always, there's a hundred ways to say every line and 80 of them will be right for that audience and 20 of them will be wrong. So in being yourself, if you're not Barack Obama, you don't try and be Barack Obama, 
you know, if he can rise to a crescendo and say, yes, we can, like a Southern preacher, you can say those words as yourself still with skill. And it might be, look, if you're asking yourself a question, can we do it? Yes, we can. You can say it conversationally as yourself. And if you believe it, it will carry the weight of the message. Trying to be, but play with it. In your rehearsal, do it in different voices. Try it in different ways. Do it in front of your, I used to rehearse in front of my dog. Because if I wasn't me, my dog would be literally, I promise you, my dog would be like this. It looked, you'd say, I don't recognize this person that's in front of me. And you're, let's be honest, your dog was the only one who would listen to you, right? Yeah, my, yeah, my wife just refused. That's absolutely true. You know, your, your point, it, it, it's, it's really important. And I, I want to emphasize, when I, when I do corporate trainings, and I have done this on numerous occasions, every now and then I get somebody who's very soft-spoken. I mean, soft-spoken to the point of I'm leaning in to, to catch the word and I'm not that far away. And then I will have them. I will ask, I will get them to say something and I'll ask their colleagues on a scale of zero to 10, what was the volume like? And I often get a two, a one, a three. Mm. I said, okay, I want to hear a five. Mm. And they try and do it. And then I, some, you, and I said, did they make it? And typically, no. I said, you didn't do five. Now you got to go eight. And on a couple of occasions, literally, and I'm not kidding, I would go to the door and I'd say, look, I'm going to stand outside now. I'm shutting the door. I want to be able to hear you through the door. And I shut the door. And sure enough, eventually, they're like shouting and yelling and yelling. And of course, the, their colleagues are clapping and clapping. I come back in. And they ask me. They say, okay, what? I'm never going to do that in the real world. And I say, of course, of course not. But the thing is, this is a sandbox in a training or at a place like Toastmasters. You can experiment. You don't have to be perfect. You can see what you are capable of. And most people, we live in a very narrow box in public and people have an authentic range that is usually bigger. Yeah. You need to find out how far you can go. And then it comes back to this whole thing of adjust your dial. Um, and one other thought on that. I, the most nervous I was last year for a speech was to one of my sons. I was asked to go and do a speech to the whole of the school about Barcelona, because I work a lot in Barcelona, about Catalan culture to help them learn about the um, thing. And, and, and sort of, um, you know, that age of children is not my usual lane. So I thought I'd, I'd ask my audience. And I said to, to William and a couple of his friends, look, I'm going to do this thing. Can you give me a bit of advice? You know, what works and what doesn't work? And he gave me one of the best bits of advice I've ever had anywhere from anybody. He said, whatever you do, Dad, just don't try and be cool. And I thought, as soon as he said it, because they went on and say, you know, because some dads come in and they want to be down with the kids and they're making jokes and they're doing this and they're trying to be wacky. And it's just embarrassing. Yeah. Yeah. And I just thought, you know, play with your energy, but don't step outside your comfort zone or their comfort zone. It's, you know, and if you're connected to them, you won't anyway. Okay. Rule three is, is step out of your lane. I mean, the, the whole thing that we've been talking about for the four podcasts from creating stronger stories from creating language that words that sing creating and using really simple visuals and then performing is we learn at our best out slightly outside of our comfort zone and for some of us we'll have a higher tolerance for that and some lower but the next time that you're speaking try something and every time you try something different do use a quotation that you wouldn't necessarily know. Leave a bit in the middle where you can actually have a conversation from the stage with the audience, but always be looking to build yourself into a more flexible speaker. If you are that empathetic person that's shown 20 minutes in that you genuinely care about this audience, even if you mess up, they're not going to hurt you. They're going to help you. They're going to help you back onto your feet. And they'll, even if you ask them a rubbish question or you make a mistake or the, they'll forgive you because human beings, generally speaking, are decent, kind, and thoughtful if they're treated with empathy and respect. And it comes back to Maya Angelou. They might forget what you did. Yeah. But they won't forget how you made them feel. Yeah. Come full circle now. We have. We and still, we have. Circumnavigated. There you go. I can't believe four, four weeks have gone by just like that. It's incredible. The presentation Guru is about. So have a couple of minutes silence from Ross and over to you. I have a couple of questions. Christina, hello. Yes, hi. 
Um, so first question is that when you were talking about the stage thing, John said divide the stage into left, middle, right, that's what I do, and also front, center, and back. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard uh, from some actor writing about public speaking that also um, depends on what you're saying. You also want to divide your stage if you have quite a big stage into front of the stage, center of the stage, and behind the stage. If you're saying something profound, maybe you move back a little to take in more of the audience. And then if you're saying, I don't know, giving an example, you move a bit forward to the front of the stage. Is there any rule or advice on that? The, the only advice I would give, if you're the smaller the room, then if you move back, you're not gonna be, you know, it, it'll still be easy for the audience to see. On a bigger stage, you don't wanna start moving too, uh, too far back. Second piece of advice is moving back actually sends a subconscious signal that something is negative. Like for example, if I say, and I'm trying to do this on, on the camera, but you know, as we all know, last year was a really tough year because you know, we were losing market share and I'm backing away. But if I want to sell some, a positive idea, if I'm telling you, oh, I think this is a fantastic idea, we should really do this, and I'm continuing to back up, there's a, a subconscious disconnect. So backing up is okay if the, what you're talking about is neutral or even negative. But if you want to sell the idea, like, we can do this. I know we are the team that is made for this project, and it's going to be great. You move forward. It carries this momentum. So this back and forth moving. So that's the second thing. The last thing, it sounds ridiculous, but I've seen this happen three times. If you're on a temporary stage in a hotel room where they set it up and they can dismantle it, I've seen people back up and fall off oh. because it's never up against the wall. So again, go walk the room early and check the stage. Well, which, which actually takes us on to another thing. Um, that I think it was uh, Bob Hope, the American comedian, um, he once said, you can do an audience will let you, will forgive you anything as long as you don't embarrass them. So let's face it, we're all going to fall off the stage. I fell into a fireplace once, but let's not talk about that. Um, we're all going to, we're all going to fall off the stage metaphorically in our lives. The only thing we can do when we do that is smile. You know, you stand up, you fix your, you put your glasses back on and you smile at the audience and you go, shall we carry on? Yeah. Anything else. If you get embarrassed, you will contaminate them with your embarrassment. If you smile, they'll go, I don't know how you did that. That's amazing. Jim, did you fall or were you pushed? <laughs> on, Moving <Jim>. on. <laughs> Moving on. Wait. Now, Bill actually said something great. I like, thank you very much, Bill. I will miss the, week, uh, the weekly refreshing sessions. This crystallizes a lot of ideas connecting. Well, even though they're not going to be weekly anymore, uh, just before too many people leave, because I know people have to go, uh, Jim and I are have already started discussing about turning this into a regular event. It may not be weekly, but whether it's bi-weekly or monthly, that's something that we are working on. So stay tuned, Bill. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Uh, and, do, and we'll keep in touch with you. We'll send the videos of all of these things. And we're doing a little, um, we're writing a little book um, with lots of links to other articles and other writers on some of these things as well, because we like to. I'm just saying, uh, Mauro, thank you very much. Relevant advanced tips, lessons to take into account. Thank you. Good speech. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and Mike, I like, I like this comment from Mike. This is, this is a big thing for me. For me, if you have nothing to show, black out the presentation. The attention will shift to you. Go back to the presentation when it's appropriate. Absolutely. On slides, and we talked about this a little bit last week on, on visuals, uh, using the blackout button, having the screen go black, or even inserting a black slide every now and then in your presentation. So you click into black, audience focuses back on you, and then you click out into the next subject matter. So that's another technique, absolutely. Hi, John and James, this is Sally. I have a question. Hi, Sally. Hi. Okay. Um, over the years, I, I have been in um, big industries and technologies and talking um, on things. Um, it has been drummed into us. You never show emotion. When you're presenting, you become very factual and neutral in your presentation. Now I'm shifting gear. John knows me a little. I'm learning to do public speaking about something I'm very passionate about. But I find that when I get on the stage and start talking, 
I that old habit kicks in yeah, and I get rid of the emotion and I become factual professor like yeah. speech which is against how I feel and how I want to convey do yeah. you have any advice how to reverse psychology myself out of this I, not so much the psychology but I think for me there's a woman there's a lady who we I would always mention when we're talking about this called Patsy Rodenberg. We'll share her details. Um, Patsy Rodenberg. She is an acting coach um, and she's worked with, so whenever a big Hollywood star is going to go and do Shakespeare, for example, she will, she'll spend time working with them about how, because it's different connecting through a lens than face to face in a crowd. She talks about three circles of energy. So the dial thing we were talking about, she said, Circle one energy, you're invisible. Nobody can hear you. It's like you're talking to yourself. Your energy flows back into you. So if I was doing that now, it would be the kind of sort of distracted discussion where, you know, it's obvious that I'm sort of thinking about other things and slightly distracted. And, and I'm not deliberately trying to do that. I've just shifted my energy into my own head. She also talks about circle three energy, which is when, and you see, and I'll say Toastmasters here, I think sometimes with inexperienced speakers, this idea of passion and energy becomes a performance. So what you're doing is you are actually performing bigger than the room, your voice is too loud, there's no eye contact, and your passion is such that everything is lost and people start thinking about the performance and not the message. So that's sort of circle three, which is a performing energy, and it's fake. It, doesn't work it's you know worst case it's showing off it's i'm the most important person in the room best case it's just a response to nerves that sometimes we turn the dial up too much but then she talks about circle two so when you were talking then sally you were speaking really sincerely really compellingly and truthfully about this thing that you're thinking about and that is circle two and i think that to be the best presenter you can be, that's how you should be. Be in circle two. Imagine that you're talking to somebody, that a friend that you love and trust about the things that concern. I don't think you have to force it. But then all of your emotion that you were talking about then, it was your emotion was truthful, honest, sincere, and grabbed our attention, I think. Mm -hmm. Um she, uh, the, Patsy wrote one last thing. Patsy Rodenberg says the problem when people do Shakespeare sometimes is everybody's in circle three. So if you know somebody's going, My liege, your horse awaits, <laughs> it's just nobody speaks like that. What you would say is, You would say, My liege, your horse awaits. You know, it's the difference between pretending to be something connected and also, so, so I wouldn't do any, any tips just to in yourself find that truthfulness because you you've obviously already got it and trust that and rehearse that voice one of the things my wife would i would would rehearse in front of my wife sometimes for big presentations and sometimes she'd say it doesn't sound like you <laughs> you know it doesn't sound like you it sounds like you're trying to be somebody else and that's really really it's tough feedback because she was usually right and it also means i'm probably not going to be as good as you were when you were explaining your question there sally because you have that authentic truthful openness about you that i think would make you a brilliant inspire you know inspiring speaker full stop sorry zip the one thing i would add agree with everything jim said so of course i i know you uh depending again in this this idea of adjusting the dial you can apply that in this case as well if you're giving a very technical presentation to a very technical audience, then clearly you're going to be more logos, more fact, more data, more logical. And you should absolutely not lose that. Mm. It doesn't, though, mean you've got, we come back to Aristotle and these three pillars of logos, which is the logic of a presentation, ethos, which is your credibility as a speaker, as a person, and then pathos, which is the emotion. And your ethos, your credibility, you always want that to be the highest. You always want that to be the highest. But logos and pathos are variable. And I think in a very technical presentation, you're most certainly going to have more logos than pathos. But you don't leave the pathos out 
all together. Mm -hmm. And I get asked by people who tell me, oh, I'm just presenting the third quarter financial report, or I'm just presenting this very technical subject. And I always tell them, I say, look, you don't want to overdo it on the storytelling and the emotion, but you really should have some in here. So drill down ultimately, because I know that I know the field that you're in with, you know, with, with, with tech and computers uh, drill down and until you hit the human element. And by that, I mean, you know, if you're dealing with something that's very technical, if you're dealing with the third quarter financial numbers, let's take somebody, an account presenting the third quarter financial numbers. The numbers didn't, in, you know, just pop out of thin air. They didn't just spontaneously appear. The number was 72 because somebody did something or somebody didn't do something. And 72 is a good number or it's a bad number. And what is the effect of this number 72? Does this mean we have to do more? Does this mean we've done a fantastic job and should create, you know, congratulate ourselves? If you keep drilling down until you find out what is the human impact about the, of the thing about which you are speaking, that's where you can find a little bit of emotion. Uh, George says, Amy Cuddy did some interesting research about authenticity. People value trust over competence. Trust comes from feeling connected to your subject. Yeah, true. I think there's a show and tell thing there. You show, you know, the great speakers show and the great connectors show their audience that they've listened, that they're important, that they matter. They don't say it. Yeah. Without, without naming names, unfortunately, sometimes people trust people who aren't very competent as we've seen in recent years, let's put it this way. Awkward, John, awkward. Not awkward, I'm just hang, letting it hang out there. People can uh, interpret, people can adjust the dial on what I said however they wish, Jim. Yeah. No, that's absolutely fine, John. And you're a Canadian, remember, that's what you've got to remember. So uh, anything else, any other things? What, um... I just, I just, um, I, I just want to thank you both. Uh, I yeah. really, I joined last week and thank you for inviting me again, Jim. I, and I want to give two Thanks things that I really liked. Really, I enjoyed it, and, and I can see the other experts there. So um, thank you for your time doing this. And if you continue this, I think that would be wonderful. Two things that I particularly learned is, one is um, your pace. It was really good to see how you also interplay and really the pace. That's something I can certainly learn because I know that I'm doing things a lot faster also. Maybe also because of my business, because I'm more of a team builder. So mm -hmm. I like to create energy and dynamism and I can see your speaker. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I really liked a lot the way you're connecting, uh, even with your concepts, stories. Mm -hmm. So today, John, your throw in the rock, that was just excellent. It was a great um, a story connecting the point. And you basically make the point by by telling us that when you use the stories, that's how messages become memorable. And I know Jim did the same thing. So I really learned those two things, particularly in just the two sessions. So I, I really want to thank you both for your time and sharing your expertise. It's a pleasure, Ramin. You know, but I always think, I always think, you know, actually what we're giving is an opinion. There are, that we are an expert audience. Everybody has their experience and whatever. And our job, I think, is to give you something that you can agree with or disagree with or or frame so, so I love the fact that we can have these conversations um, and, and, and learn from each other. It's, it's, that's inspiring. In, in that context, Jim, I didn't say anything about um, charisma. Mm -hmm. I was really interested to hear your point of view because mm -hmm. I learned charisma in a completely different way. And that's actually how I met John because I did my MBA five years ago, an executive MBA. And I was taking it by an expert in leadership on charisma. Antonakis, perhaps? John Antonakis, right? Okay. Yeah. And, and you know, so, but that's a different discussion because I yeah. thought it's interesting when you said everybody, because uh, from that point of view, it wouldn't be everybody because it's something actually you learn with different techniques. Yeah, the leadership behaviors, that sort of thing. But you see, John, I, I, I've written about John, and I think some of those things that those charismatic leadership tactics, I think he talks about, are, are, it's a really interesting and useful set of tools that I've used myself with, with people. I think. If anybody hasn't read John Antonakis on, uh, on charisma and leadership, there's some really useful stuff there, I mean, isn't there, I think? It, it is. And in fact, I always thought, I mean, the, the feedback that I gave him at the MBA was, in fact, I think it's a lot more about uh, rhetoric and yeah. not speaking than about leadership. But yeah, yeah okay. again, another no, discussion, a, but it's interesting. Yeah, it's a great point. I, I do believe, though, that if you, you know, when you see people 
mm. who may not be very charismatic on stage, if you catch them at certain moments in their everyday life, having dinner with their family or speaking with friends and colleagues, you can see glimpses of it. You can see moments when they are. And it's really just, the, but then, as you said, Remy, this is where you work on it to, so that you can actually bring that up on the stage and present it that way. I think it's a bit like a tiger, John. You know, there's that moment where the tiger, if you're in the, he suddenly goes like this and he switches all of his energy onto you. Jim, we don't have tigers in Canada. If it, was a, if it had been a bear, I would have understood. But. Yeah, that's true. I, you know, I saw, uh, this is completely irrelevant, but I saw a brilliant video on YouTube that you can look for. Young couple, 35 something, walking in the woods in Canada, just videoing and in love and all this kind of stuff. And then suddenly he went, bear. And they froze. And this two ton bear yeah. came sprinting yeah. to them and passed them and off into the distance. And I have never seen two people look so terrified and relieved in the same moment at the same time. And for the first time ever, I truly understood what a bear is because I'm from England and we don't have any. Yeah, they're big. Amazing. Yeah. That was that emotional might, contagion. That might not be a bad place to end this whole webinar series. We're at 6.30 now. Beautiful. May I ask a quick question? Um, yes. I have been unfortunate enough not to catch all your um, events. Mm -hmm. Is there a place we can watch the videos for the ones we miss? Yeah, yes. Well, I will put it back up again. I, I, it's in the chat. It's our, the website is called Presentation Guru. I'll, I'm going to put it up here now. Presentation hyphen guru.com. Every video is up there. They're all up there. It's on YouTube. So you will, you will be able to find it. Perfect. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Perfect. So yeah, thanks everybody. Thank um, you. Bye. All of it. Lovely to meet you and see you. Cheers, Mel. Thanks a lot. And we'll see you again. And um, if any of you would like to write for Presentation Guru, we want expert voices on all kinds of things, however narrow or broad. Um, just send me or John an email and we'd love to, uh, love to have you there as well. We get hundreds of thousands of page views a month and we want to build a community. It's not a profit-making venture. We want to build a community of people that have a voice so it's not just the same voices being heard. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a lovely afternoon, evening, or morning, depending on where you are.